I don't see them in the chat. Okay, so let's put this away. Maybe I'll just start drawing this out and we'll start uh, doing this one. I did send you also, um, <laughs> Siri's listening to me. I sent you some images on Instagram of for Kat and Paulina and DJ of um, some things that I wanted to talk about too today and some photos from Elliot O'Hara's book because it really helps to illustrate some of the things that you need to keep in mind when painting. This I'm changing this around. We're going to do this vertical. Try to put it here in the middle more. Let's see. Did you have a good day, Paulina? I'm gonna put some music on too. I think we'll try some piano music today. That's nice. Okay, so. Let's just put the horizon in, we'll make it a high horizon line here. And I don't think we wanna do exactly the whole thing. Maybe I'll crop it. Uh, maybe this would be a better crop. Sometimes it's easier to look at it with a cut out to get, that looks nice, just do the small boats on this side to get a composition. And this is a really nice composition right here. So let's try to do that. Take this on here. If you can take a screenshot of that, it probably would be helpful because I don't know if you'll be able to see it in the um, next to my painting here. So I always go for the horizon line and then I just put a couple little boats on here. It's really kind of fuzzy. It's hard to see what those shapes are. There's like some buildings back there and the boats are in the front of them. So this I should have maybe put this over a little more, so maybe we'll just... Put that there. And I mean, it's such a small sketch that it really shouldn't matter too much, but... It 
maybe this boat next to it is a little lower. So we'll have this one, and then this one is in front of it. We'll overlap it a little. But, oh, I want the mass. I like the way the mass are going up taller back here on this side of the page. So. That's kind of nice. Maybe this one's shorter then. And I think we'll have this boat going this way. That's pretty simple. And then our reflection's coming down here. Maybe there's another boat behind there. And a few of these masks kind of have That's good. And then back here, just there's trees. So, you know, you don't need much to indicate those. And I don't want to put a bunch of graphite pencil marks all over my paper back there. So just keep it simple. And then maybe behind here, there's a little bit too. And then our reflections. And all the rest of this is just, um, You know, you just keep it very simple. Hey, cat. Oh, you like the picture? Yay. You're here. Welcome. Let me put up the picture again so you can all take a screenshot of it. This is one of the little harbors in Elizabeth City. And I painted this during one of the plein air events there. So beautiful there. Kat, you and I drove to Elizabeth City, but you had just gotten off a night shift. And you were really sleepy. So we, we, had, to, we had to run off to uh, another beach. So we just kept driving. I had to stop there and pick up um, some of my artwork. But... Um, Anyway, you know, for giggles, why don't we put another little, there's something here in the water. Uh, it's not really a boat, it's just like, I can't even tell what it is. But with all this stuff going on on this side, it's good to have a couple little things here, even if we don't really know what they are. And maybe it's a dock, maybe it's whatever. Okay, so we have a lot of soft, hazy sky and soft, hazy water, so I think it might be good to do a tiny bit of spritzing on here in the sky just to get a little bit of water on there to give you a little more time with the clouds so they don't look too hard. And any good medium-sized 10 brush is plenty for this little 5 by 7 size. see my friend Ann on YouTube. Uh, maybe she's there. Someone's watching. I hope it's you, Ann. <laughs> I hope you're going to paint with us maybe today. Ann is a friend that I met in a art class here in Raleigh, and she eventually she's originally from Sri Lanka, but she has all her family in England, and she recently moved back. Well, no, it's been a couple years now, but anyway. <laughs> move the paints a little oh yeah sorry I didn't realize that was thanks for letting me know I um I was in a frantic thing today because I was trying to find I have another metal palette that's larger and um let me see let me get this hold on let me go to this other screen where I can
There we go. All right, so just for reference. Oh, I turned it around too. I decided that I'm, I'm going to try to use it uh, in a different direction. But let me, let's move that back there a little. Um, I wanted to change out all my paints. And I was, I decided, well, maybe I'll just get out my other palette and put them in there the way I want them. And I couldn't find the other palette. So we're back to this one. And it's a little bit confusing because I've mixed up some warms with um, with some some cool colors, which I should really change around. This one over here on the very far left is neutral tint. This is, um, uh, let me think, mineral violet. Why don't I go ahead and um, show you what some of those colors look like, just in case. I, I think you, yeah, in the most part, you, you two probably don't have mineral violet, but this is mineral violet. This is a color that is nice mixed in a little bit with neutral tint to make kind of a cool violety sort of gray. Then the next color here, I believe, is pyroline maroon and then of course burnt sienna oh hmm anyway burnt sienna ultramarine and then um, cobalt this one is left empty. Then I have uh, turquoise, which is, it's actually um, turquoise light. I think of the name of it. Then I have cerulean blue, which I really should change that into a different. And I have a phthalo blue, which is really bright. And then this one over here is um, I think that might be hooker's green. Then I, up here I have a lizard and crimson, a cad red, or you might have like scarlet. This is a burnt umber. This one is a, um, you know, this one might be in pyroline maroon. Doesn't matter, you shouldn't have it anyway. Um, this is a cat orange, or sometimes it's called like a permanent orange. This is yellow ochre. This is a light lemon yellow. This is raw sienna if you can see these. This one is leftover of Quinn Rose. And then this is a, uh, I think it's like a dioxazine purple. It's a violet. And then this is lavender, just on the very end. And the last one is uh, titanium white or sometimes I use Chinese white and it's got it's contaminated with some blue from what I was doing yesterday so just to give you an idea but I do want to change my palette around because it's gotten pretty mixed up and uh, I haven't done it yet so anyway um, hey DJ Hype, hype. DJ, where have you been? I was looking for you. <laughs> um, okay, so I did send you, the three of you, all um, some pictures 
And to my friend Anne here, I could send her some pictures too. Um, did I put them on here? Yeah. Let's see if I can. I'll just send them to her. Because we're going to talk about these. But I thought I'd get started with the painting because I don't want to bore you guys to death. But um, anyway, okay, so. I put a little water on there to get it a tiny bit damp and it's already drying because I've been talking about color on my palette, but there we go. Okay. So this guy has these crazy colors in it. Now, you know if I paint it this way, it's going to look pretty, pretty uh, rainbowy. So. I don't think you can really paint it that way. I think you need to tone it down a bit. Otherwise, it's just going to look like confetti, which uh, I don't really like in a painting. I want it to be, I mean, I like color, and sometimes I overdo it with color. I really should cool it, but uh, I'm going to try to tone this down a little bit. I've done a study on this before. Uh, if I was digging around for it, I could probably find it. I did it on Twitch a while back, a real small one, and it turned out kind of cool, but all right, so let's put in a little purple. I think I want to use a little yellow ochre in there, and that pink, we're going to use alizarin. push that um, the brightness back there of that the sunset so right here where it's really <clears throat> the Sun is blazing in yellow I'm going to use that light uh, yellow color and I haven't really got the top part of this the way I want it so I'm going to put some red in there and then try to get back in there with my purple. Let's see if I can. The best thing to do with this guy is put it in quickly and leave it alone. And my paper's tilted a little and you can see it, um, the color coming down because I've used quite a bit of water up there and I don't really mind that. I think it's okay. And I think on the edges here, it's going to be dark with trees, but we'll just use a little bit of yellow ochre on those edges. And as you come down to the tops of the boats again, and whatever's back there, I like to leave a little bit of light in there for highlights. So that's it for the sky. And then essentially you want to do the same thing for the foreground. And I could maybe even add, you know what, there's a little bit more orange in there. So I'll pop in a little bit here and there. Really have a blazing sunset. We'll see how that, ooh, we'll see how that does. I can't really do much else or it's gonna, if I add more water, I'll get blooms. Um, if you add just pure paint, you can kind of get away with it where it's still damp, but you don't want it to start pulling the paint up or in different directions because you've added more water. So kind of once you've done the sky, that's don't mess with it. It's my best advice. Okay. Um, so 
Let's think about how we would do this down here. Um, I would just put in a soft light color. Maybe start with this yellow with a tiny bit of this orange here and pink, the pink, the alizarin crimson color. You want warm underneath, but you're gonna add in some of those other colors, so especially right here. Just try to get it going. Keeping some of that warmth in there. That's really bright. All right, let's get some alizarin crimson. Paulina, you didn't get your pictures on Instagram? And then let's pop in some of that red. We can put it here because that's going to go um, dark on each side. So just pull some of that down. And you can drag the brush down like this and pull it down a little bit. Get some of that yellow moving around. A little bit of pink back here maybe. Pink. It's really alizarin crimson, just not very dark. And um, our other shadows are going to go over the top of that. So as we come down the page, a little bit of warmth in here, here and there, and a little bit of that bluish purple. Ooh, that's bright. Let's go back to a blue color. As I come forward, I'm kind of going back and forth, but And the blue is just leftover um, cobalt that's in my palette from yesterday. Paulina, you didn't get your pictures that I sent on Insta? Let me see. Oh, failed to send. Oh, you know what? Maybe I am. Um, Sun. Let me retry. I don't know what happened. Uh, hmm. Okay, wait. Let me try again. Maybe I'll just send two at a time and see if they show up. Let me know if they show up. Two. There's three. <laughs> now you see it okay good all right so <clears throat> probably would be good advice right now to dry this off maybe i'll dry it with my hair dryer and then we'll come back in with uh, some of the other shapes <clears throat> I'll turn off my mic now. Okay, so I have to think about, uh, okay, is it rainy or sunny in Raleigh today? That's the question.
Oh, I was supposed to say I keep you mute. Okay, all right. You still have to guess whether it's sunny or rainy in Raleigh today or cloudy or whatever. <laughs> I'll just tell you, it's drizzly and overcast and not, not a great day outside. It's cold too. So <sighs> that's what I was thinking, kids. Oh, see, you got it. It's rainy. You both got it. All right. Okay. I want to look for the other one I did of this really quick. I wonder if I can find it quickly. I did this painting on Twitch a while back, and... Um, it was really a little tiny one that I did. It was pretty cute. I don't know where it went. Let's see if I can find it. I think it's in here. <gasps> I think it is in here. Let me see. See, somebody was asking me about doing these before. And, oh, here it is. See, I did it before, but I did it with the other boat in there. And actually, I should fix some of these boats because they're too. These are too white. The ones behind there need to be made a different color. And see how I did the crazy colors down here, the reflections, and the sky. I like the way this one turned out. It's more expressive, but we'll try to. We're going to see how this one... I should have maybe put more blue in the sky instead of just purple. And also down in the... Down in here, it could have been more light. Not pretty? Okay. What are these little ones? These are from a long time ago. I'll show you. These are little studies. I don't know when I did them, but aren't they cute? Here. I don't have a lot of patience for the details, but you guys will probably be. If, you, if you're a detail-oriented person and you like to um, make things realistic looking, then you'll have a good time painting in those kinds of things. I mean, sometimes I get a little more, you know, I, I'm very, I can be very careful and make those hazy things in the distance and then the boats look real, but in general, I try to be more expressive and not too, okay, so, the studies are so cute. And those are just little squares of, you know, three by three or two by two. Uh, yeah, they're more like three by three, I guess. Well, these are ones you can do, see it's three inches this way and over four inches, four and a half inches that way on this one. And the other ones, especially you can take these like, if you have a failed water, watercolor painting and it's just not happening for you, you know, you can cut it up. And I've seen even seen people, whoops, take these in a binder, put them in a, little binder or sketchbook that you can make on your own and there's lots of YouTube videos on how to bind and um, then you can sit in a coffee shop and do your cute little sketches and your little paintings and see these are on the back of uh, you know some watercolor it didn't work out I just cut it up look at how terrible this wash is on here Terrible. 
I don't know what I was doing. Okay. So enough chit chat. This is drying nicely now. It's not totally dry yet, but it's dry enough for what we're going to do. Yeah, I think it's good to to uh, have fun with your painting, whatever makes you happy to just paint uh, very expressively if you can, if you want to, and not worry about having it look like anything except your own expression of whatever it is. Okay, so now for these trees and things, so on and so forth. They're definitely a dark value and they lean, well, I don't know, the, the, in the photography, everything gets really saturated dark in your photos, so you have to be somewhat of a designer to figure out mm, what colors you want to put in there. And I see a lot of warm colors. Like in this one, I used like greens and blues, and they're definitely dark. Cool on this side, a little warmer on this side. So in this case, I think I would just put in a little... Hmm. I think I would just make up a nice um, kind of dark with burnt sienna and ultramarine. Oh, I'm using my dirty palette and it's... Let's clean this off. I don't like that. It looks, it looks like it's... I want a nice wash back there. I don't want it to look heavy and yucky. So <laughs> that's a technical term, heavy and yucky. You know, there's one other color that might look really good in this, and that is quinacridone gold, which I had on my palette yesterday because I was working on, let me show you. I was trying to work on a couple of um, Sedona landscapes because it was my neighbor's anniversary. And um, I did this one, which is about 11 by 11. And I wasn't entirely happy with it. Then I did a smaller one, and I'm not very happy with this one either. But I used quinacridone gold in there, and it's a nice color. It goes a long way. And I should try to find it here so you can see it. And this kind of gold in the seascape makes me, it reminds me of this color. So I'm going to put it right here where I had it yesterday on my palette. And I'm going to show you what it looks like. And it's Daniel Smith's quinacridone gold. Okay. Uh, where's my test page? Here we go. Now this color goes a long, long way. It's very bright, it's very saturated, and it's really um, you know, one of those neon -y. And I think it's pretty staining too, but you'd have to look it up. So once you put it down, it may not lift too well. But yeah, I think it's going to leave like kind of a yellow stain. So probably not good for lifting. But you can double check on the Daniel Smith website. They'll tell you if it's well, actually, it should say on the tube, in case you don't know this. So it's, the pigment is quinacridone deep gold. Uh, the pigment number is 49. 
Uh, da, 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 da. Wait, where is the... Okay, they say it's Series 2 Light Fast. Where does it say? Da, da. Oh, P.O. So it's... I gotta remember the chart. I gave my chart away, but it should say, like, if it's opaque or transparent, and this says P.O., so I think it means that it's... I forget what that means. Um, oh, I have to, I wish I had my color chart out here. I could tell you. But anyway, on the, on the labels, they have all of these indicators that tell you. And you can just go to the Google um, Daniel Smith, and it'll tell you the pigment number, what's in it, what pigment is in it. See, this, is, this one is PB15 which is copper phalocyanine, which is Windsor blue green shade. And then it tells you the series, how light fast it is. And um, it also should say on here whether it's staining or not and whether it's granulating. Some of them tell you if they're granulating and the transparency, if it's transparent or opaque. So... Anyway, all those things are on your paint tubes, or you can look them up on the paint manufacturer's website. And there's millions of um, videos all about the different paints. So just use your basic palette to set them out, and then if you want to do your test sheet and make a color chart with them, that's a good idea. What do you do with my... No, oh, I was looking for another. <laughs> it's actually kind of hard to keep everything um, close by. Oh, here it is. It's right... No, that's not it. Right behind me. I have some other some other things here. I was gonna. It's probably right underneath me. Nope. Anyway, okay. Well, when I find it, I'll show you. But color charts. How long do they last once you open them? They last for a long, long time, as long as you keep the caps on tight. Um, they may dry up over a number of years, but in general, cat, your paints are gonna last you a long, long time. And I suggest that you squeeze a good amount into your palette just to have it. Uh, once they're in your palette, you can add water and reconstitute them, so they'll be just fine. It's nice to start out with a fresh um, you know, a fresh squeeze when you're painting, but you don't have to. Like, you know, they're just fine when they're, they've been sitting in your palette like this. Just use them and don't worry. Some people say always use fresh paint. Well, you can't always use fresh paint. I mean, when we went to Italy last fall, I loaded up my palette um, with a huge amount of paint a few days in advance so it would dry and not run all over on the airplane. You know, so I didn't have to take a million tubes with me. Um, so my palettes were filled up. But anyway, okay, so now that I have this, I'm trying to create some kind of interesting color for these trees in the background. And I want to use something kind of transparent here. So maybe this ultramarine blue. Um, but I've got to darken it up. You know, maybe I'll use a little alizarin crimson. Ooh, that, that went. That's pretty dark. And also I could use um, a tiny bit of neutral tint in there maybe. That makes kind of a nice purple. And oops, I want to switch it up a little. 
I'm going to use the side of the brush just to bring up, just bring it up into the sky and make some random shapes for trees. And I'll leave some of these little holes, sky holes, where you can see beneath there. And then as I get towards the bottom of these trees, I'll make, I'll make it a little bit darker, a little bit thicker paint, maybe a little bluer as well. I don't know. Yeah, you can see that. You can see what's going on. So that it's not just one big blob. You want to vary it so that it's kind of interesting for the viewer. This color shade and the how you control the edges of that. And you can do that with your brush. I'm looking for, oh, here we go. If you have a one of these jagged kind of Chinese brushes, you can use that to, well, if it was working, you could use it to add some texture to the edges of these trees here and there, like that. So Paulina, your paints didn't come yet? I'm sad. And I'm just gonna keep working across here and try to indicate a little bit of that sky there maybe. A little more of the pink. And there's some other little objects there in the back. So I'll just do that. Make a few little brush strokes. And then on the other side, we're going to do the same thing with the trees. Now, <clears throat> maybe on the other side, I'll make it. It shouldn't be exactly the same as on the right hand side. So we'll make this side a little more red. And of course, not the same shape as the first one. Ooh, that red is really pretty. A lizard and crimson. And then, of course, again on the just try to use a scruffy brush. Sometimes what you can do is like go to the dollar store or a cheap store and get, you know, like a couple cheap brushes and then just do this and smush them and destroy the ends of it. Or get one of these cheap Chinese things and use it as a scruffy brush to make some edges. That's kind of nice. The other thing you can do while the paint is drying, or kind of getting dry maybe, looks like it may be too dry over here already, but you can scrape into it to get a, you know, a little indication of the branches. You have to wait until just the right time. It can't be too wet. There we go. Um, if it's too wet, the paint is going to just fall back into the canal that you've made with this thing. But you can also pull up some edges because it's pulling the paint. Well, I don't want to do any more there because I've already got quite a few scratches in there. But that's one of the little things that you can do. And I think along the edges of this tree up here, I will also try to just get a few branches going here and there. I'm 
Let me check the chat. Oh, okay. Are we doing okay, everybody? Is everybody good? Just a few little. I'm probably not the best at doing tree shapes, but. And then you can go back in this other one as it's more dry now, and you can put some darker branches going up. And that's always fun to put in those little details, some dry brush marks, and you can do the same thing here. This isn't dry yet, but there you go. You get the idea. And maybe down here, I don't know, drag a few marks here and there. Okay. All right. So now, Let's go ahead and try to work a little bit of color into some of these boats. So <clears throat> they're all pretty bluish looking in shadow. There's just a little white highlight on the tops of some of them and some are more blue in shadow than others. So we just need like a purpley blue and as, it, as they sit on the water, there's a deep shadow under them which is really hard to see, but you can see this real dark line. So the boats are lighter than that line. So you want like a blue and then a dark line, and then it goes into your pink and blues and orange colors. So blue, dark, blue. And what I would do is just mix up again our same colors. Uh, blue with a tiny bit of and try to save some lights up there on the top of the boats a few a few lights here and there and you can vary these boat colors as you're going across. In fact, you can even grab a little bit of cobalt blue to mix it up. And I probably made that a tiny bit too dark. I want it more like that. So I just rolled up a paper towel and just blotted the whole thing. Of course, as you get to the bottom of the boat, where it's touching the water, that's where you want the darker color. So you can start with a lighter wash on top and then let it bleed down into the, we're gonna take it down into the shadows. I'm gonna try to do this all in one swoop here. And this little, this little junk over here will do the same thing. That looks like I left that. Uh, maybe I'll mix in a little bit of brown with that and let it get brown towards the bottom of this junk over here, which is the burnt sienna and blue together. And see how that made a nice, same thing here. I'm gonna go a little darker with the burnt sienna under these boats. The top we can detail more as we go. In fact, this one back here, there's one back there. It's a little junk there. Okay, so now it's into the shadows and you kind of have to be brave when you do this. So we want a little bit of a dark mix under the boat. Oof. That purple, I picked up that purple, it's way too dark. Don't touch that. So a little bit of ultramarine, a little burnt sienna, and I kind of want it a little bit thicker than that. Maybe a little purple in there. Okay, so 
Now I'm working on the reflection of these boats that I have. And um, you have to be a little bit careful. Same thing with this one. We're going to join the reflections together. And I'm working on these two. While I'm doing that, I'm going to just pull this down to make a nice reflection there on that side of the painting. And then I'm going to keep going with my getting my little bit more dark under that boat. And let's do this reflection here, which is just a tiny bit more blue. Trying to keep it loose but interesting following the lines of the boat in the reflection, which is... not always easy. And leave some gaps for the pink part. Um, and then as we get over here, I'm going to bring the reflection along this side of the painting. And then I'm going to put these masts in. And they're coming down like this and then getting a little ripply. Same thing here. Add a few ripples. Oh, you love that purple? Yeah, you know, there are some great colors out there that I'll show you the tube to show you what I'm using and I'll get my color book out and show you the different purples because there's a lot of them and um, it's now there's also a darker reflection on this side of those trees so I've got to mix up a little bit more of a warmer so a little burnt sienna and a little ultramarine to suggest these, the reflection of these trees down here on this side. And that's more of a solid reflection in the water. Like that. And how far do I want it to go down? Uh, as it fades out, I can make it a little more pink. Just to make it interesting. And then I can go ahead and add a little more of that pink reflection coming across the water there. Just try to make it believable and interesting, uh, if that makes sense. Sometimes when you're out at, you know, uh, near the ocean or whatever, and you see a reflections off the boats they're just beautiful and you think my god if I painted it that way though nobody would believe me it doesn't look believable because <laughs> it's often kind of I'm just going to add a little more reflection color into a little more color into that and um, I still don't have it dark enough under these boats which and the reason I don't is because I didn't use enough pigment I used there was too much water on my brush it should have been a little bit heavier on the pigment there so I'm just going to add some of that darkness in there and hope that it will work there are some real masters that can do that really well and um it takes some practice, so I'll just try to fudge it here and make that look like it belongs. And I sort of like 
what I've got going there. I don't think I want to do too much more to it. Um, um, I do like how in the photo, these reflections here have a little bit of blue in them. So I'm just gonna, while this is still damp, I'm just gonna add a tiny bit of cobalt. I'm gonna sneak it in there and hope it that it works. Isn't that pretty? And over here below this, this junk that's over here, there's also a little bit of blue, which I may just dot a little on there. Okay. And maybe I'll put a little blue highlight on that boat. All right. All right, I'll make a little bit more reflection down here maybe. Just um, maybe just a few little suggestions like that. And I'll probably connect, try to connect. Mm. Do I want any more connections here? Maybe these could be connected a tiny bit more. Should probably use the purple for that, but more of the more of a purpley color, I guess. There we go. Maybe we'll put a couple reflections coming down off of this stuff. All right, well, let's get a little bit of detail on the top of these boats. Mainly just some blue and burnt sienna to indicate some dark shapes. And you should use um, kind of a creamy buttery mix to put in these details. You don't want water going all over the place here because you're just trying to make suggestions of boat uh, top of the boat junk stuff. <laughs> oh my goodness, top of the boat junk. Hold on, let me see who's on here now. Judy, I have some messages from my cousin. And, oh, DJ, you did, you put a little, excuse me, you put a little more um, color in the foreground of your seascape. Look at that. Now put a couple little birds in the sky and along the sand there, put a couple little doodads to break it up a little. Splatter a little paint in the foreground. It looks like you did. It's kind of hard to see. Yeah. Um, didn't you do a nice job? The other thing you can do, DJ, is um, you can do a, a few little lines across the sand to indicate, um, you know, sand is flat but it also gets wet with water and then there's um, I'll even do it in the right color so if you do a little um, take a little bit of burnt sienna if you want you can just tone it down with a little bit of um, you know make a few of these little lines across the sand and then where you have your the other thing is, um, yeah, you can take a, you know, a fairly loaded brush with your burnt sienna and you can put, you know, little, little darker spots here and there, dashes and doodads and things to make it look like there's little things along the, you know, to give the sand some definition there, a little bit. 
of course and then you can always it looks like you did use some splatter and then way up by the where the beach is you know lighter little things like that and maybe you have it in there and I just can't see it because it's yeah I can see some of that going on that's good I'm trying to look at it to see if there's anything else I would do. I think you put a couple birds in the sky and then on a few dark spots in your sand like this. If they get too dark, just touch the edge with a little damp brush and lift it with a paper towel. And under your little doodads of sand, you can also put a tiny bit of blue in there blue, purple, whatever, for a little shadow color, if you want, like that, to make it even more interesting. <laughs> nice. Okay. All right. So let's put these masks in this picture are really just kind of dark shapes but notice they're dark here but as you go through the tree what happens they appear light and the tree is dark that's pretty cool because the light is hitting them against those dark trees and they light up so let's try to do that I never like those masks um, to be too purplish. I think they should be more brown or um, or have a little blue shade in them, not necessarily purple. So I think they look funny. They look kind of fake. Maybe there's another boat there. And over here, maybe there's something. And then there's also these, oops, oh, that wasn't a very graceful mass line, you know, the lines that are on the boats. Here, maybe I can make one. There we go. And, you know, I just saw this spot here and realized that that needs some shadow back in there. It can't look like that. All right. Maybe we'll put a little um, cobalt turquoise here on the top of some of those boats. And then I should get out the Chinese white. Oops, I'm gonna move my easel. Um, where, oh, where is it? I have titanium white gouache, I'll just use that. So, DJ, do you remember the time that um, you were on my stream? And you had, you ha I hadn't been streaming for a long time, so you came back in my stream and you're like, oh yeah, I remember you, you were in my stream a long time ago. And then I, you decided that you were gonna paint along with me and then I forgot I had an appointment and I had to go after you'd dr already drawn out the <laughs> the painting that we were doing. I felt so bad. So I'm putting in these white highlights now there. 
and maybe I do the same here and this dark here looks a little heavy so maybe I'll just thin that out a little and at the risk of being overly obvious try to put a little white sail on that boat easy to overdo it. That kind of looks good like that. I don't know. All right. And then I guess I would use a little bit of a couple little splatters in the sky like that. That's the flock of, flock of geese that are flying off. When I was there, it was in, I think, October. And so it was fall, and there were pretty colors like this in the trees. And um, the geese probably were flying. Where do they go, north for the winter or south? Anyway. And I think on these reflections, I might just make, I want a little more darkness on the bottom of the boats. But anyway, this guy here should be a better shape. Kat, how did yours turn out? Do you want to send me a picture if you're painting with us or DJ? Any problems? <laughs> the purple you can make too, um, Kat, by mixing your ultramarine with alizarin crimson with your red. Which color red did you get in your kit? You probably got like a pyrrole red and a, maybe another one. A warm red and a cool red. I think back here I could add a little more. Maybe a little more brown back there. And a little bit of warm color back there along the edge of the forest there. I should see if I can find the big painting that I did. Um, let's see if... I think I'm just going to sign it. I think that's all I want to do with it. And I think I'll just sign it with this purple. Sometimes it's hard to stop painting when you're painting. You have pyrrol and deep scarlet. Okay. So I wish I had my um, Daniel Smith color chart. I gave it to someone and then I, um, when I was doing a workshop and then I, um, I emailed them and asked them for another one and they never responded. So maybe I need to send the email to a different email address. I probably would 
probably I, if I just called customer service, they'd send me one. It's probably the best thing to do. Forget about the emails. Just call their store. They have their store in Seattle. I've been there. Not that that matters, but they do have, um, you know, the painters that represent their brand come in and do uh, demos once in a while, which is really nice. I happened to be there one time when they were doing demos. So um, I think I'll take the tape off of this. find my color book. So there we go. This is, um, these are some colors that you might like to invest in, Kat, as you go on in your journey, all of you guys actually. This is Carbazol Violet. And wait a minute. Yeah. And then this is, this color here is green gold. That's a fun color. And this is quinacridone violet, and this one is quinacridone magenta. I like them both, but I like the magenta, I think, a little bit better because it doesn't go quite as blue, quite as purpley. I mean, if I wanted magenta to go a little more purple, I can just add a little more of the carbazole violet to it. So... Um, Take a look at those for a minute while I, here's my paint color book. So what I did is I just took this sketchbook, which is, um, the it's a visual art journal sketchbook. And I use it, this one, just for sampling out my paints. Now. You can go online and find people that do this like a science. I mean, like, I swear they just spend hours making perfect little grids and perfect little color swatches. But that's not me. <laughs> I just tried to make myself a practical guide so that when I pick up a paint color, or if I see a paint color, I can kind of get an idea of what it is. W whatever colors you have, you should make yourself a little chart and just put them in there so you know. Um, so I put all my blues here. And um, I do tend to buy a lot of paints, you know, and I've, I've gotten quite a few over the last few years when I started painting again. And so you always are tempted to try new colors. So anyway, um, this is M. Graham's Cobalt Teal. That's a beautiful color, really is. And so is their turquoise. But it's very dark, it's very, um, uh, it looks like it's very transparent, but it's probably also very staining. I'm not sure about that. Sometimes I write down whether they're staining or not, but I'm not, I don't, I'm, I don't have that detail on there. These are some of my warm colors. So Burnt Umber, these are just two different brands. Doesn't matter, I just happen to have them both so I put them both on there. But this is Transparent Pyrrol Orange. And this is the pyroline maroon that I was talking about um, earlier. I think I have it on my palette, but I wasn't sure if that was it. And so also, it's a good way I could take it off my palette and put a dot there and see if it is in fact pyroline maroon or 
you know, whatever I put on there. This is the quinacridone gold that we use today. Uh, well, I was going to use more of it, but I didn't end up using it. And um, so now, Kat, you said you had... They have in the website. Oh, they do have it in the website? Oh, TJ, you're so good. You look it up. Um, yeah, they'll tell you what if it's transparent or opaque or staining or non-staining and exactly the pigment. The, the P is for a pigment number. Um, so, Kat, you said you had... Um, Oh, pyrrole and deep scarlet. Okay, so I have transparent pyrrole orange and I have cad red scar scarlet, uh, pyrrole red. So that's a warm red. Um, cad red light is what I have on my palette right now. I'm trying to use it up because I'm going to switch to pyrrole red because it's less toxic, I guess. It doesn't have the cadmium in it. And then this is pyrrole red. This one is more um, cooler. It has more blue in it. This pyrrole red. This one is more like a cad red, like a scarlet. Pyrrole red PR254. Mm -mm. That's down here. I don't know why I have that up there. Oh, because it has, it's a, it's a combination of yellow and pyrrole red. So see what they did? They took the PR254 right here, and they added nickel titanate yellow uh, PY53 to it. And that's how they come up with cad red scarlet hue. So that's why I wrote the both of them, because it's a combination of paints. So if you were trying to do something with just a cool red, you'd want to use one that's pure red and doesn't have yellow added to it, like this one. I mean, it depends what you're going to do to it. Since that's already a mix of two colors, you have to be careful adding a third and fourth because you'll get mud, because you've got red in there and yellow. And then if you add blue to it, it could turn kind of muddy. So that's why sometimes it's a science to really understand the colors that you're using if you're, if you're really into that. The Daniel Smith website. If you just Google Daniel Smith, you, it will come up right away. <clears throat> There's also another reference that I'm going to tell you right now, Kat, that you should write down. There's a lady on... Um, the internet and her name is Jane Blundell she's a paint kind of a watercolor paint guru and she has like I'm almost afraid to tell you this because I'm afraid you'll go there and you'll never get out of there but she talks about all the different paint colors and what they're good for and if they're light fast if they're warm cool mixes transparent opaque whatever for days and it's Jane Blundell art blogspot.com Got it? Jane Blundell. That's a good one. There's some other ones too that are good for um, but once that one pops up they'll all pop up and then you can see paint swatches for days. Here's some greens. I have a bunch of new greens that I, I don't think I've necessarily um, put out. This is a nice color palette that you can try. It's just like an alizarin crimson, which would be like the one that you have, cat, the reddish pinkish red and indie indie blue is indenthrene 
blue, which is like blue jean blue. You can just use um, ultramarine blue or cobalt and then yellow ochre. And that gets you a nice color range to use. But someday we can talk just about some color palettes that are nice to use together. This is Robert Wade's palette. See this right here? This is magic. This is what you want to try to achieve. So he uses a rose matter, which, I don't know, I kind of like the quinacridone rose or magenta. And then um, cobalt, cerulean, aurelian, which is this nice, this is a color you probably want to invest in. Um, you know, as you get, it's a, it's a cool yellow. And then, um, you know, here it's just mixed with the, uh, most likely with um, either yellow ochre or um, the rose matter. And then phthalo blue, which some people don't like it because it, it's really strong and it tends to go over all over your palette and get everything messy, but I like phthalo blue because you can make really nice darks with it. And look what happens when you mix it with the rose color. You get that purple that we were talking about. So you can make your own purple. I just got your photo cat, so let me take a look. Oh, look at your picture of San Francisco. I have to, can I show everybody? The go-to watercolor section. <laughs> oh, you tried to give the, the link for Daniel Smith? Hmm. Hmm. Thanks DJ for doing that. Um, oh, Kat's picture painting. Okay, so Kat had a couple days off, and she missed our um, class on Tuesday. So she was doing our lesson from the other day. And look at her beautiful painting of San Francisco. I love it. Very nice. Very nice. Did you have fun doing that, Kat? You've been there, haven't you? I'm sure you have. And of course, now our friends live there. That's wonderful. And um, DJ, did I show your paintings? Yeah, I showed the one of the beach that you did. You did the waves really well. I have never really tried to do waves like that. Well, look at that. That's amazing. Did you do any other ones, Kat, besides the, um, the San Francisco little thumbnail? How big did you paint that? Your sketchbook is like five by eight or something. Is that right? Yeah. Are you excited? I'm excited for you. <laughs> I really am. Okay, here's some more color mixes that I was playing around with. This is Quinn Rose and Thalo Blue. Quinn Rose and Yellow Ochre. Look at this beautiful color. Quinacridone Rose and cobalt and here's your purple quin rose and ultramarine and look at this is one of my very favorites quin rose and sap green and then down here it's quin rose with um cobalt turquoise light look what happens to that isn't that wild I 
I must have had some mother blue mm, on my brush when I did that because I don't think it could have gotten that color, but maybe. I see the cobalt in there, but just a little bit. But this makes a beautiful, look at that beautiful brownish greenish color. You can get really, um, you know, just fascinated with color. But typically in watercolor, you never really want to use a pure color except on a highlight of something, you know, like to emphasize, like just a pure color for a little accent. Generally, you want to mix your colors so that they're not straight out of the tube. And I'm still guilty of that in some ways because they say most of your paintings should be, you know, made up of, mm, you know, third colors or tertiary colors. So you mix two to get a third. So you mix a, a blue and a red to get a purple, or you mix a blue and a yellow to get a green, um, that kind of thing. It's Most of your paintings should be with those um, tertiary colors, combinations of two colors. And you never really want to mix more than three colors together or you really will get, you know, you, you can get into the muddy zone, I guess, if you want to call it that. So, all right, boys and girls. Now I want to show you something interesting from one of my books that I was looking at. Let me look at the chat. Oh, you haven't been to San Francisco yet? Oh, okay. Boy, if we ever get over this virus thing, how many places do people want to go? Hmm? People want to move around and see things. All right, so put those over there. Now, I want to show you this book. This is an old, old book that I saw on um, Amazon as I was shopping for something. I don't know what. But I love all the old-fashioned watercolorists, especially the what they call the California School of Watercolor, where they went out and they painted plein air, and they painted everything with, you know, big brush strokes and um, bold color and... Uh, texture and it was all very fresh and exciting watercolor like this and um, I saw this book come up on there and um, I got it because this guy is an old-timer he's he's he died in 1969 but some of his lessons in here are um, really worthwhile looking at. And that's why I sent you these pictures from him. And I think I sent you, um, oh, cat, is that another one? Your other one didn't turn out very well. Here it is, but don't show this one. <laughs> okay, I won't show it. Nice, okay. Is that the one from the, yeah, the, uh, okay. You're not done with that one yet, though I can see. Okay, so. Um, did I send this picture? Oh, maybe this one I didn't send to you guys. But look at this. First of all, his lessons are all, he has all these lessons. And um, he talks about his procedure and problems and paintings. And this is before books printed everything in color. Like only a few pages were in color. So um, you get to see his design. And this simple design right here is something everybody should try. In fact, maybe we'll do one of these next if we have time. I think it's time for a little spritzer though, don't you? Jojo, where is he? Maybe he'd make me one. I haven't been a good girl today though, so I'm not sure if he will, but we'll try. Okay, let me get, let me see where he is. Joey Dee?
Okay. So. I talked to Joe. He's going to make me a spritzer. All right. So you can learn a lot from these guys. Um, this guy actually was from Boston, I think. He wasn't, he wasn't on the other coast. But if you look at his designs, and look what he talks about first again in his book, values. Now, if you take just your um, two colors, ultramarine and... You mix it up with a little bit of some other kind of dark color and get a nice dark. Uh, you can use neutral tint. You can use burnt sienna and ultramarine for the darkest darks. You can put them in last or you can put them in first. So um, anyway, values again. But I wanted to show you. So here's this beach scene. And DJ, remember how I was telling you you can put little things in the sand to add texture? And also on your beach scene, um, one thing that's nice to do, even if you're looking at it straight on, you can kind of make, make it, maybe make it uh, slightly diagonal here where the water is, you know, not necessarily, but it just gives you a little bit more dimension. Oh, thanks, honey. There you go. Thank you. Wow. Wow. i got to sit down now. Okay. <laughs> Master sugar coating. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cat. Oh, it was the castle painting that she was trying to do. Yeah, that was a hard one. That really was. I don't know where my nose. But let's talk about this. Because now look at, see the texture and just little doodads, like I said, on the beach here and there. Um, here's some people walking away, walking that way. And then the little umbrella on the beach with people is fun to do too. And notice on the people, he's just got like the highlight on the arm. And, you know, maybe a tiny bit, the faces are lighter than the hair, but it's kind of hard to see. There's maybe a highlight right on the, near the neck, the clothing there, whatever she's wearing. And some dry brush strokes back along the edge of the beach there. But that's very pretty kind of silhouette. All right, next. I have to show you, and the reason why I'm showing you that is so that you should try to do some of your paintings just in light, medium, and dark tones to figure out the design. Now, here's a complicated one. This is like the one cat that you're trying to do right now that has the lights and darks it's got a lot of shapes the rooftops and the foliage down at the bottom and look at how he transitioned the sky is like just basically you know white he may have put a really light wash of something on there but look at how he gets this atmospheric perspective in there. Everything back there is light, 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 light. Some whites, even whites, just plain white. Light, 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 light. And then he gradually comes closer and gets it a little bit darker. And then, boom, you've got white, dark, light, dark. Light coming here on this side, medium here, and then dark, 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 dark. And here, these... These in the, you know, the, the painting is about the light on these buildings. Here in the foreground, he's made it really just very simple, abstract, with a little dry brush. But isn't that a beautiful painting for an old, an old painting? 1948. Okay. And simple little shape for the roof, this tower on this church, the bell tower with the cross. 
Kind of fun, huh? Okay, let's see. Are those painted black and white or just made for journal? Okay, so now, as I was saying, there are some color plates. So let's see. Some of these might be, but I think they're from the color plates. So if I go to number 30 here on the color plate, you can see it in color. So that's kind of my, my point. One of them I sent to you in color. Where's number 30? 29. Nope, this one's not in color that I can find. So maybe he did it in black and white. It says, this painting illustrates knowing the use of painterly textures to subordinate a detailed distance. The section above the roofs painted in one drying time was rough brushed with cobalt and touches of raw sienna. So it looks like it was probably painted in um, with color, but they just used black and white photography for this thing. Um, the wis wisps of smoke were removed from the damp area with a clean dry brush right here. So while it's damp, you can lift things out either with a brush or paper towel or whatever, rolled up paper towel. Um, now look at this, talk about, you know, if you want to add some excitement to your paintings, he calls this a Florida quickie. Look at the dry brush marks and the bold strokes on these shapes. He didn't do that by mistake. That was very intentional. He knew exactly where he wanted those bold shapes to be. He silhouetted this lady and this guy on the park bench. He said, this is a 10 minute class demonstration. He worked mainly from light to dark, painting the figures first. He used as dry a brush as possible so that he could paint around them soon. The arches of the background outlined the rear figures. Well, there's actually figures back here, but it's hard to see. It's just a I guess a 10 minute sketch, so. The deep darks uh, around the bench, shadows, he used a dark, dark green, deep darks, put in them last with a very dry brush. Okay, now, oh my gosh, look at this painting. This is something everybody has painted. This is in Paris, of course, the opera. And just if you went on Pinterest and you Googled Opera Paris paintings, you'd see a million. But I love these old fashioned shapes, old fashioned, where he's outlined the umbrellas in a very calligraphic style. And uh, the old fashioned look of these buses and cars with the cobalt turquoise color. <clears throat> Really? First year of independence, 1948? DJ, you could probably tell us a lot about the history of India on our stream. That would be nice to know. <laughs> you have a lot of those old colonial style buildings too, right? From the, the colonists that were there. All right, I sent you a few more of these black and white ones because I wanted you to um, try to paint them to, under, to help you understand values and how good values and shapes can help in your painting. Now I also sent you this one in color. I'm not sure if everybody got this because um, let me know if you didn't get this one. But I loved what he did with the sky. And he simplified that whole building. Like if you were in New Jersey looking across the bay at New York City or the ocean or whatever that is, um, you would see a silhouette 
especially maybe in the evening, anywhere you are like a sunset, a silhouette. And look at how this is just one big, huge shape, differentiated only a tiny bit by color and a few lines here and there. I'll try to get it. Oh, there, you can see it better now. So there was a plan for this in, in, in the composition. And he knew this was going to be one big bat, backlit, silhouetted dark shape in the sunset. So he made the sky really striking. And that makes a beautiful composition. Instead of trying to paint every little thing in here that you could see, he just simplified it, which is a good thing to do. Okay, let me see. Oh, okay. No more news. And then, well, this one I didn't send to you, but I wanted to show you because we're going to try to paint this sometime. This reminds me of Sedona and the West. And I just love this painting because look at how he used um, these complementary colors the violet and the yellow are gold violet and the simple brush strokes of this tree and then this valley look at the lights he left and the very soft edges but he still has enough detail in there to let you know it's the valley this is crafted very well you can learn a lot from that the gradient wash and this color was not out of a tube he mixed this you can see the the bluish purple in there and the um, whatever he used yellow ochre or um, uh, cad yellow or cad orange probably he doesn't say or I would tell you Uh, it was an illustration for lesson number 25 so anyway that's just like so gorgeous I just want to jump right in there look at the distant mountains way in the back how he did that very carefully I mean they're a little bit hard edged on top and then they fade into nothing <laughs> wow I can only dream. I love this one too. Because this is, um, he calls it the Inland Sea in Japan. Look how he shaped that mountain with those brush strokes. He used probably a flat brush on that. And then look at again his simplified shapes of this, these buildings, whatever this is. You don't even know what it is. He just describes it. He doesn't detail it he just suggests and then of course the foil you've got the big shape the medium shape and then the small shape which is this beautiful little sailboat and again he used blue and yellow complementary you know violet and yellow blue and orange see the orange little flag I mean, so when you're looking for, if thinking about the color in your paintings, think about complementary colors and then tertiary colors that go together. So if you take a look at your color wheel, you've got this blue violet mountain. Oops, my color wheel stuck together well used. So here's your blue violet mountain. All right. And if you look directly across, you get yellow orange. And if you look to the sides, you get your split complementary colors. So your complement is in the orange range and yellow range. So that's why he did this. So if you're ever stuck in a painting and you don't know you're thinking about what kind of palette should I use? 
Think about your complementary colors. Um, I could talk about the red orange in this one. And of course it goes to the blue violet. Oops, gotta get it over here where you can see it. Sorry, I probably didn't, I hope you could see that. Oh, when did I start doing art? I started doing art when I was about 27 or 28 years old. So 25, 20, 30 years ago. And um, yes, his stuff is very, is very blocky. Um, you know, at this period of time in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, you kind of had like that industrial sort of, um, what do they call it? Um... I'm trying to think of the New York school. Um, things were, the, uh, and like the Art Deco, how things were like more uh, linear and stripy and um, think of Georgia O'Keeffe's, her paintings of New York City at that time. I'm trying to think of some of the artists that have um, that kind of structure going on, the, the buildings. They're very bold. Here's one. Look up the Ashcan School in New York, and um, what was with the buildings? Uh, the the modern when they started painting modern buildings, uh, very structure structure like. There's some of that in this. What was your other question? Structured and blocky. Yeah, that's. Um, well, I want you to see that because a good painting is built on that foundation of structure. And so his black and whites give you that, you know, the idea of keeping that structure together in a painting. It holds the painting together. But, you know, I mean, you can look at modern paintings and, and these are watercolors too, so... <clears throat> then styles change over over the years, but the, um, not the technique, but the, um, the advice is the same. Simple shapes, design, you know, good values. Um, if you don't have th those basics, it'll be hard to do a painting that um, it's best to start with strong, um, simple shapes and designs. And these are really good examples of that in black and white. Kind of the bones of your painting, right? And yeah, they do look a little old fashioned because they are. But if you look at George O'Keeffe's work now, I mean, her stuff, some of it looks very old fashioned. And um, especially some of her watercolors. Anyway, so what else did I send you? Um, here's another one of the rocks. I might have sent you this one because of the variety of paint in these shapes. Makes it very interesting, very beautiful. Okay, all right, here's one more little silhouette. Look at the beautiful wash in this. And the, the sky is just one little stripe of, you know, blue in there, kind of over here it fades out, but simplicity sometimes is, 
And if you're going to do a simple painting like that, you have to keep the whole painting simple. Like, don't do something super simple up here and then have a, a crazy uh, checkerboard pattern down here. It may not work out so well. Try to keep your painting unified together. Oh, I think I sent you this one, which is a good study of this cliff overlooking the ocean. Let's see. <laughs> Carolyn's art style is just like the master she followed. Sometimes it is. I mean, I, I usually start most of my paintings the way Alvaro does, yeah. But that's, um, that's one way. You know, I use, usually use like a three-step method. You put your washes in first, your first wash, your lighter washes, and then the mid values and darks go on after the first wash dries. And then after that, I put in the, um, the final calligraphy and details at the end. That's generally the way I paint. But you can do it all a la prima, all at once, too. Uh, here was another one of these. I don't know if I sent you this one. These cliffs are great. So practice doing your simple paintings. Let's see. Rooftops. Um, oh, I love this one, too. Look at these. Look at this. Isn't that great? This painting of these uh, palm trees blowing in the wind. 1942, he painted that. Probably wouldn't look quite so good if you painted all those palm trees standing up and no wind, right? It's that movement that takes you into the painting and just it's just beautiful. Okay, let's see. I guess, oh, I love this one too, but it's just a simple sketch. I just like the quickness of it. In this demonstration, he was demonstrating how to do the shadows on the house, which you can barely see. I think probably in the photography it didn't show up as well, but... He uses a lot of rough brushing to minimize detail in windows and doors. Yeah, well, everybody does that nowadays. Dry brush. Here he calls it rough brushing. It's the same as dry brush. Anyway. Oh, there's some tree shapes. Trees in black and white. Here's a lot of tree studies. These are These would be good to do. Look at this one. Look at how he has this trunk and shadow up here under the foliage, and then it goes to white. And not just white, this white is against dark. And this is against dark. So it makes them pop out. Always think about your lights and darks in your paintings. Look at this one. That's pretty masterful. I couldn't do that. Mm -mm. Oh, it reminds
reminds you of a palm tree I did a while ago. Really? Was that on a tutorial day or just... Because I did one, I did a tutorial of palm trees at the beach. That I think that's on YouTube. This is a picture of one of Alvaro's paintings. So that's, that's the guy that I've studied with quite a bit. And of course his style is really well known because he's a master. And um, there it is. So look at the complementary color in that, the violet and the yellow. We've got a pale sky and a little yellow ochre here in the foreground. And then of course, your dark shadows and the yellow. And look at here, he's got violet, dark, cool color here, and warm here. And the opposite up here. That's what makes him a master, not to mention the washes and the brush strokes the painterly brush strokes. Yeah, palm trees are good studies to do. They're nice studies to do. Um, okay, so... What do you think we should do now? This is one of the palm tree things that I did kind of as a tutorial. I'm going to take a break. <laughs> it's break time for me. What do you think about that? He did just like the other artist did, blue and orange, right? Remember your complementary colors. Mm-hmm. I don't always get it right. Here's another one of his paintings. And another one. Here's another. Another one. He does a lot of street scenes. I like to do street scenes too. I like to do the buildings and all the little detail -y stuff in there. Sure, I can show you today's painting after it's dried. Yeah, it it's actually looks really nice. I like it. And I'll take, now this is the painting from the other day. Look at how nicely that dried. I'm trying to figure out how to get it to. That was fun to paint. Okay, so. I'll take this one. Put a little mat on it. 
Paulina, are you just chomping at the bit to paint? You should be. Well, I'm kind of cutting part of it off there. I won't do that. I'll just show you like this. What do you think? Now, if I was going to do this for like to, you know, put it in a competition or sell it or whatever, I would be a lot more careful about how those boats are painted. I mean, on a small painting like this, you can get away with it. But as you start painting larger, it's going to get a little more difficult. And so I would practice this with, um, you know, a really neutral color palette. And also try to work from a photograph where you do have, where you can see some of the detail on the boats. Because here I just kind of roughed it in, like, and it could be a lot more, it could be better there. You know, this area down here where it's dark, that should be light to dark in a gradual way, and, and the dark should kind of just blend into the shadows. But <clears throat> no one's going to look at it that close, but still. <laughs> no doubt I got the competition prize. I did get a prize recently at a comp, well, I guess it was a competition. It was our local watercolor society, and I have to admit that I have not been very active in that society because I just, I just don't do those things very much. I'd rather go out and paint on my own, and I don't know. But anyway, some people are very into those things, and they really participate and do a lot of, I don't know, schmoozing and socializing and entering competitions and all that stuff and I don't um, I don't do a lot of that but um, I have a couple friends that I paint with in, locally here and they are very active in that society so they encouraged me to uh, enter this regional show for our regional we have a the North Carolina watercolor society has three regions I think and I'm in the central region and they have a local show here in, excuse me, in a small town. And it was one of those days when you don't want to leave the house because the weather's nasty and it's rainy and cold and whatever. But I told them I would enter the show. And I got a third place prize. <laughs> and it was a painting of the Durham Bulls, um, the area where the where the movie was made, the Durham Bulls uh, baseball stadium. There's a big old tower over there from the old days when they made tobacco over there. And um, the tower is, is, is got the name Lucky Strike on it. Remember in the old days when they had Lucky Strike cigarettes? DJ, you wouldn't know. Paulina, you wouldn't know. Katerina, you wouldn't know. Um, but Lucky Strikes were cigarettes, and that's what this area is known for in North Carolina, is the tobacco business. And so the Lucky Strike Tower is over there, and that was my painting. And I took it over there, I put it in the show, and um, I realized I didn't photograph the painting after. I'd kind of fixed it up a little, I wasn't quite happy with it. I took a picture of it, and then I said, no, no, it needs this. But then I never took a final picture of it, so I thought, well, I can post it that I won third place, but I don't have a good photo of it, but I should probably post it anyway, just so I don't get my thinking, you know, my imposter syndrome. What? Me? I'm not a watercolor painter. So, um, but yeah, that will be my... My fourth win in a in a watercolor competition, which I don't usually do, so it's kind of funny. Yeah, 
I didn't even know I won until somebody told me on um, Facebook. And they didn't even know what I won or anything or which painting, because I put two paintings in. I thought maybe the other one would win because it was of Tuscany, and a lot of people like Tuscany, but it was the Durham Bulls. Okay. <laughs> you support a spritz break, Kat? Are you having a spritz? It might be a little early for you. Boy, this mat board that I have here is really kind of shabby. I should uh, cut another one this size because I often paint kind of small for these little demos. They don't all turn out, though. I mean, a lot of paintings that don't turn out still. It's, it never, it, you'll never be totally satisfied. I mean, you'll get a few winners, but there's always going to be some dogs that you don't like. And... It's hard to, um, so does anybody want me to, um, uh, help them along in their, with their paintings? Like, is, could I offer any suggestions to what you're working on or, um, DJ, I already talked about your, the one that you have of the beach and... Kat, I saw your one in San Francisco, and I thought it was tremendous effort. Um, I didn't really look at it with a critical eye. I just looked at it as a, not that I have the best critical eye, but um, tell me what you guys want to do. What time is it? 5.11. We've still got some time. You're trying the church alley picture that I sent. Oh, okay. The church alley, which one was that? Let me look, on Instagram, the one I sent? Wait a minute. Oh, do you mean the one with the blue and yellow? Because I didn't send that to everybody, but I will. On the gram, Instagram. Okay, so let's see. I need to save, photo save. Let me see if I can send it to everybody. It's kind of an Alvaro styled painting of a street scene with a church. And let me tell you, it's not gonna be easy because that's a difficult one. It has architecture and deep colors and transitions, so. Let me see, Lover of the Sea. Here it is. Okay, and then, why does this thing keep telling me they're failing to send? I, I know our internet has been, today Joe was working with it to, um, but it should send. Tell me, DJ and um, Pauline, if you got those. And maybe I'll send that to Ann, too, if I can find her on here. I don't know if Ann's on Instagram. Hmm. Ann, Ann, if you're listening, we've got to sign you up for Instagram because it's easy for me to send out the photos that are on my phone from there really quickly. Hmm. See, it says failed to send. I don't know why. Let me see. <laughs> 
Forever Young special dance version. You know what, DJ, though? My stream got cut. Well, I don't know if it got cut, but they got flagged for um, content because um, of the music they recognized. So I have to keep the music neutral. <laughs> Alphaville? I'll listen to it after the stream. But YouTube, um, yeah, they flagged my last, the last one for uh, whatever. So DJ, did you get the... Oh, you followed that artist for a long time. She's so nice. She's really good. She's a really good artist. She's an architect. Um, probably does a lot of illustrating, but her watercolors are beautiful. Um, so you got it. Paulina, did you get the photo? <clears throat> I have to look it up again. Uh, oops. Sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Let me try to find that photo and see if I can work up a... There it is. Yeah. You know what that reminds me of is, um, I wonder if it is, Axe en Provence. Because I've painted that, but I'm not sure if that's Axe en Provence or not. It might not be. But it kind of looks that way. Here, I'll put it up. It's pretty. It's just that in the on the screen here you can't really see the the value change in those colors. It's not just a big thing of black. There's actually blues in there, grays, you know, some warm brownish colors there, see it in the corner. And then the highlight blue color, that saturated, uh, I'm not sure what color that is. It's kind of like a cerulean. It's a beautiful painting. They let Twitch to play YouTube songs. They let, they let Twitch to play YouTube songs. On Twitch, they, they will, they'll just cut out the sound in your video if you use, um, music that you're not supposed to, right? Kat wants to try this one. Well, let's do a, a little one. Let's do a little sketch of this. <laughs> She's such a master. I know that, what's her name? Not Ludolf, Nadia, is it Nadia? Ludolf, yeah, she's a master. I think she has classes online too that you can take. Um, okay, so let me go ahead and get a piece of paper and we'll do a little sketch. Um, this is a little piece of paper that I got at the art sale. It's um, Fabriano's 140 pound watercolor paper. It's a test paper, so maybe I'll use that on this painting. I want to keep this picture close by because I'm going to need it for the drawing. So I'll do that. And let me take this down. I 
really like these. They're called a duo. Duralar. Acetate. Acetate. High performance polyester film, non tearing, lays flat, heat resistant. Um, I just put it over my gator board so that I can affix my paintings to it. You all don't need it, but it's helpful for me to have to try and keep so I can put a painting on here and still um, lift it off when I need to. And clean off the edges. So let's go ahead and oh I want to do a vertical, don't I? Maybe I'll turn that around then. That's better. I'm not convinced I'm going to like this Fabriano paper, but I mean, I've used it before. I've had workshop teachers that use it. I'm just so used to using arches and also um, Saunders I like too, but we'll try this. Kat, in your sketchbook, you can try taping the edges, too, if you want, to get a crisp edge around your paintings. Try some really low-tack masking tape, because typically in a sketchbook, the paper's not as thick, and it'll tear, or when you pull up the tape, it'll pull up a little bit of the fiber with it. But sometimes you can, or you can use artist tape, maybe. And with artist tape, because it's a little thicker, and you can wipe it off. Uh, you might be able to use it more than once. And it'll keep the edges of your sketchbook clean so that you have a nice um, a nice edge around your paintings, a white border. And it just makes your sketchbook look nice. And always save all your sketches, no matter how horrible you think they are, because you're going to need them. Uh, what did I do with my, I was looking for, yeah, it's nice to have a border around your sketches, you know, in your sketchbook. And artist tape is uh, low tack so that it, um, you know, you can easily pull it, pull it off of the paper without ripping it. Sometimes masking tape will pull up the fibers of certain certain papers. They're not very thick, but it, it does give you a nice little border. Remember these, DJ? We were doing these one day. There's a palm tree. <laughs> you're old enough to say you started, but you're the age when I started painting. I didn't start painting till I was like 27, 28, 29. The Russian lady. Okay, yeah, Paulina. She has math education and started painting late. Oh, so there you go, DJ. I 
I wonder what late means for her, Paulina. Well, I think you can learn a lot from her. I mean, she's very talented. But, you know, the thing is, is it's all about practice. I was on um, Instagram scrolling through uh, last week, I, I think it was. And there was a Chinese artist on there. Uh, she goes by the name of Sophia. You can look her up on Instagram. Every day she posts new paintings, sometimes two or three. She's just like painting. She must be painting like all day long, all the time and just posting and like so focused. And, um, and she does detailed architectural drawings too. I mean, it's insane. But, you know, that's the kind of thing. It's like learning to play an instrument or a violin or a piano or, you know, becoming extremely proficient in something. You have to do it over and over and over and over. So, um, you know, don't get discouraged is the main thing because you're going to have days when you think, oh my gosh. But just keep following the you know, the main principles and, and you'll get there. I'm making big eyes at everybody. Carolyn made the right question. What's the right question, DJ? What's the right question? All right, let's draw this thing in. So there's a big steeple here, kind of uh, about rightish here. And it's got some things hanging off the edge here. Now I gotta be careful because this the edge of this building over here and I don't have their original like thing so I'm just kind of winging it I'm not gonna make it exact but uh, let's see so uh, here wait I'm gonna fix this I'm gonna try to draw it sketch it in pretty quickly and that's not a cop-out for trying to do it right. It's just that if I tried to do it exact, exact, we'd be here all day. So this kind of comes down. If you look at this church here, from this point to there, and then this is coming down this way to the circular structure of that thing. And this is about from this triangle in this tower. Uh, let's see. And then there's this, this um, window in the tower. And directly opposite that is this, oh, this, this structure. It's a little wider than that. And there's a bunch of architectural detail there. I'm going to pull this down just a tad. And of course, this is one of those elaborate stained glass window things here. And you've got more rooftops. Try to vary them in size and shape if you can, coming down into there. And then you've got some windows here that are and some window shapes there. And here they're less obvious but still there and you have some shadow shapes and then you've got a whole nother set and under here is another yet another little triangle let's make it a little smaller 
Actually, it's steeper, so let's make it a little steeper. And some details there, and a cross, and a little cross up there. And um, here, inside this, we have a nice little shape and then shadow side over here and there's a little under that thing there's shadow under that I'll try to pencil that in and this And this all comes down to nothing. And then over here we have yet another tower. Oh my goodness, really. There's another tower. Are you all drawing this? Probably not, right? Paulina, it would be good. I know you don't have your paints, but it'd be good to try to sketch out a few of these things so that when you get your paints, you might be able to do some of this. There's a little shadow there, some shadow there. Uh, I'm not sure how that's going to look. I don't really have that quite right. Okay, the important thing is to not stress on the details. Remember, simplify, right? Because the details aren't that important. And here we go. And uh, down here we have, you know, some more dark shapes to suggest more architectural details coming down the line there. And then over here, against this, there's some kind of roof there. Actually, I don't like that shape. It's too obtrusive to that thing. I want it there, but I don't want it like focal point of the painting. And then over here, it's just dark roof shapes. I'm not sure. Let's see. This is all dark, dark. Up here is. I didn't really make enough room for that. Maybe I'll put it. Okay, let's try to get it in here. Because this is a nice little thing, this, this um, scrolly little lantern here. We won't be able to make it quite as big as it is, but we'll have it, we'll have it in there slightly and that scroll there. And then this is all dark. And then this roof comes out here again. This is dark, dark. And then it goes back in. And then there's like a roof back here in the distance. Ugh, okay, like that. And then this this is all dark. And over here, sometimes that's the thing about copying someone else's drawing is you get, you're more free when you do your own thing uh, a lot of times, I think. 
I'm going to think about this one now. This is a little lamp. It's much more fun to do your own drawing of from your own reference material. You kind of can get caught up in details when you're trying to draw somebody else's thing and it's really just dark shapes there. And But you want the shapes to be interesting. So there we go. And um, here, let's try to, I don't know, she's got a couple things in here. I don't know what they are, but they come down there. So that's it. And a few birds. So DJ, you've been following these watercolor artists for a long time, it seems like. You're really interested in it. And you ended up here with me. <laughs> I gotta see what's going on in the chat. What was the right question? Oh, what is late means to that artist. Yeah, what is late? It's never too late. Never, ever. There's guys that start painting when they're 80 and they're like internationally known. I mean, it's all, you know, what, it's all out there in the universe. It's whatever comes to you. Um, you know, Kat could be the best nurse on the planet and Paulina could be the, the best marketing guru on the planet. And in three years, she might, they might both say, you know what, I'm just going to be teaching watercolor from now on and painting around the world because, um, it hit me. It hit me like a ton of bricks. And that's what I'm going to, that's what I was destined to do. That's not the case for me, but I still like painting. Let me get some fresh water. All right, what time is it? 5.37, okay, so we're gonna be done with this by 6.30 for sure, and probably before then, so like another 45 minutes. Um, and so it might be a good idea to just give ourselves a little timer and say, you know what, we're not gonna fuss about the painting, we're just gonna, um, We're just going to try to paint it quickly as a study and get it done. While I'm talking here, I'm just going to put in any other little details that I think might be good to have. One of the guys that I painted with in his workshops is Joseph Spookvich. And um, sometimes what he likes to do is use his pencil drawing to become part of the painting. So some of these details he'll draw in pencil with the intention that they're gonna stay there. And that still is a little bit big there. Maybe that's with the intention of those things staying in the painting. So these little kind of things here, things in the windows, I mean, if you look at her painting close enough, you'll see all these little dots and dark marks um, here. And, you know, I studied with uh, another painter who is an architect or architectural illustrator. And I said, what are all these little dots and things you put on. And he said, well, in, in school, in architecture school, they teach him that every line has a beginning and an end point. 
And, you know, typically where things are joined together, there's the dot or the shadow or whatever. And so they indicate that as a harder mark. And you can see that clearly in her work as an architect that she's identifying those things. So there you go. Is that it on the, am I down to the last thing? Okay. Okay. So. Um, let's see if I can. I'll really super zoom in on this. How about that? Is everybody still here? What time did we start at? We started at three, four, five, so it'll be three hours. All right. So the strategy on this painting is just to, um, we're gonna use a warm and cool color palette, mainly with yellow ochre, cerulean blue, ultramarine blue, and burnt sienna. And I think our goal is to get those washes um, as fluid as we can and light where they need to be light and dark where they need to be dark without making them too heavy. If you make them too heavy you kind of lose the transparency and um, it's not always easy. So I'm just going to give my paper a little spritz kind of right there in the center. And I'm going to take my brush and start out with some cerulean blue. I really need a little bit more. Hmm. You guys are pretty quiet right now. Is everybody drawing? an example of how not to put your paints away. My cerulean blue top was not on tight, so it's kind of a little mess. All right. Um, so I wonder what I did with my larger palette. I had it for a, while, a long time. I used it on my desk, but then I wasn't really enjoying it because um, I think it was just too big. And so I just went back to this one, which is plenty big. And um, I don't know where the big one went. I was looking all over for it, but I still haven't found it. Thirsty. I didn't drink enough water today. <laughs> I think I have some more club soda here. <laughs> Cheers. All right, there we go. So who else is watching us? On my screen it says five people are watching, so. Well, maybe it's just um, my screen, cats, Paulina's, DJ's, and maybe it's my computer screen, too. I feel bad for my friend Anne because she wanted to get on. I don't think she did, but she could be watching and just not have her account, her YouTube account signed up. I'll have to figure that out because she's fun to paint with. We used to go plein air painting here. We painted at Duke Gardens. Remember, Kat, I took you over to Duke Gardens when you were here? And Duke University has a beautiful public garden right there by the university campus and the hospital. And they have, um, you know, traditional Asian garden and... Uh, they have like a little 
uh, farm garden area for kids. They have like the lily pond kind of thing, the French, the bridge with the whole Asian garden theme and it's just beautiful in the spring. In fact, we should go over there. I wonder if it's open during this thing. I don't know. But um, anyway, Duke Gardens. And um, we painted at a couple of our other little spots around here too. So anyway, I'm going to start. And I need some cerulean blue here on top. That's why I got it going. DJ, are you going to paint this? This is one where you really need the gravity to get that paint going down. Now remember, I'm using Fabriano paper on this. And um, Fabriano is, um, I got to stand up. I can't see what I'm doing because the glare on the um, thing. I put the light on my face so I don't look so dark. Okay, so I need yellow ochre all along in here and all along this thing. And on this part of the church here, which is pretty light, it should be light. And this blue, I'll just, whoops, a little bit, that's okay. Let's pull that down. And then this can all be warm here. Try to keep that part light. You can always, you know, use a tissue to dampen off or a sponge to dampen off your brush. If you have too much water on it and you have to kind of control the water as much as you can. We're going down the page here. One side of this tower is a little bit darker than the other. And there we go. Now, as we get towards the bottom, all the darks are going to be in the next wash. So I'm just going to come down the side here and on this side, I'm noticing a little more warm underneath, so I'm adding a little bit of that warm red to the wash over there. And maybe a little bit here around these windows. I'll just pull it up with my brush right there. And maybe a little bit there. And then back to kind of a diluted there's really no whites down here in the bottom of the page, so that can just go into a kind of a yellow ochre wash. And I'll dry off the edges of my paper, so I don't want that to really bleed back in there. Not that it matters on this little sketch, but let's try to make it nice. Okay. <clears throat> While this is damp, but it is losing its sheen, there's not a lot of shine left, so it's really soaking in there into this Fabriano paper. There's a tiny bit of shine here, actually, if I look at it from the side. But So right now is a good time to maybe just add a little bit of yellow ochre and cerulean blue. Uh, I got too much purple on this palette. I need to get this off of here because it's in the way right now. We're not using any purple color in this thing. It's just all yellow and blue. Later we'll get into some darks, but not right now. So I'm going to just take a smaller brush, grab a little of that and a little bit of burnt sienna. Oops, it's right here. 
I have that kind of mixed up because um, right here there's a little I'm just adding a few little shadows there while I see them and while it's still damp so they kind of diffuse a little bit Kat, what kind of burnt sienna did they give you? Oh, I know it's really late for you guys. We can finish this tomorrow. This is the first wash. Well, maybe not tomorrow, but maybe tomorrow. Do you want to finish it tomorrow? Well, Kat and I can finish it tonight, and then um, you guys can watch the video tomorrow. Cat, <laughs> you're nervous to try it? <laughs> well, you can always watch me paint it and then try it tomorrow with the, uh, or try it later after the video. Burnt Sienna Light. Okay, good. Yeah, I haven't tried that color yet. I know that Alvaro, I think... For a while, he was on the fence on the Daniel Smith Burnt Sienna color, but then they had him come in, and he created like his own custom mix, so it should be good. I haven't tried that one yet, though. But I can tell you, whatever Burnt Sienna I have right now on my palette, I'm not liking it. Um, so I'm trying to mix up some kind of dark Burnt Sienna here to put on this roof tile. Ugh, horrible, horrible stroke there. All right, I'm going right into it here with I'm just going for it. Um, it might work, it might not. I don't like this paper, I can tell you right now. It's not. Maybe because it's still a little bit wet, I should wait for it to dry. But, um... All right, let me get my hair dryer out because this is this needs to be dry first. And Paulina and um, DJ, if you guys are off to bed, I totally understand. Just tomorrow is um, Friday, isn't it? Saturday, and then we have sketchbook Sunday. But maybe I'll stream. Um, tomorrow night or well tomorrow night would be too late maybe on Saturday for sure on Sunday though we will have sketchbook Sunday so if you want you can leave me some messages in the comments on um, on YouTube would be great if you left a few comments there um, because then it um, tell me what you guys want to do on Sun sketchbook Sunday what you want to work on and we can go from there. I think I'll leave that alone and then just... try to come back over that maybe with another little dark and just let it kind of bleed down like that. I'm not very happy about this. Little edge there. It was a little too hard. It needs to be a little softer. Let me see what you guys are saying. Okay. 
It's all good. All right. So yellow ochre. You know, it looks like her yellow. She may have used a little bit of that lemony kind of yellow too in her. It looks like a warm yellow though, like maybe a um, cad lemon light or whatever. Not a cool yellow, but Ugh. note to self, make sure I put ye two yellows in my palette. One that's mixed with green and one that is clear of you know, having no green. Well, that's definitely way too cool. So I'm going to tone it down here with a little orange. Cat orange. <laughs> it's going to be horrible. I need to dry my paper. Let's... Uh, I'll just tone it down here with some yellow ochre. There we go. I kind of wanted to just keep painting, but I do need to dry it with the hair dryer, so give me a sec. All right, what did I say? If anyone's still awake. <laughs> okay, good. I'm glad you enjoyed them, you guys. Get a good night's sleep. You can finish watching this tomorrow, assuming that I finish it tonight. Otherwise, we'll, we'll pick up another day and um, hopefully you'll have your your watercolor paints by then and um, we can continue painting but I'll keep doing this so that you'll have something to do tomorrow if, if your paints arrive Paulina and um, DJ I know you're gonna do your your best work ever tomorrow right good night you guys cat I'm gonna continue on here for a little bit if you're gonna stick around that's dry enough. All right, let's see what we've got here. You know, it would be nice in this um, in this rooftop is a little bit of this clean gold. It's such a beautiful warm color. Look how that just jazzes that right up. I'm gonna try to put that light down a little. It's supposed to be a ring light for my face, but there we go. I think it's going to, all right, so a little bit of this, oof, look at how bright that is. Good Lord. Dampen that off. That's just way too much. Okay. And let's get some, uh, on the rooftop here. A little there. A few little dashes on there. I'm just having fun with this cat, just kind of putting in <clears throat> so
some of the midtones right now. So um, I'm going to keep looking at my reference photo there. So around this window, there's uh, like an arch here. You want to kind of put it in and then soften it out. This is a hard one for you, Kat, to try. It really is. Uh, this is a really like technical piece because it has not only the architecture, which you have to draw, but um, you know, there's all these different um, edges and shapes and things that. One thing about this painting, though, that if you do paint it, it has kind of your traditional mix of cerulean, I mean, um, ultramarine and burnt sienna. And I um, should be able to get, ugh, it's just not working. It's way too dark. should be able to, I should have used more water there. But, um, This is where finesse comes in. Anyway, I think this Fabriano paper is, I'm not used to it, and it's giving me a little bit of a fit. Okay, well anyway, we're just gonna let that dry. Uh, so I'm gonna work on, Let's go ahead and work on the midtones in this building here. This this tower a little bit. You know, there's just not much there. It's it's that's even like a little bit too much. Oh, this one. Okay, so here we have uh, this kind of roof color, and then it comes down, and then you can just let that be. Over here, this is all going to go dark. And we can put that in with our ultramarine blue. A little burnt sienna, a little neutral tint. And just get that in. I probably don't have enough pigment on my... You know, I'm going to use a little cad red in that with the ultramarine to get a nice dark. So your warm red and ultramarine is the ticket here. See that nice dark? And you can vary it by adding a little bit, dropping in little hints of different colors to vary that so it doesn't look like just one big old massive shape so you can pull out a tiny bit here and there all right and then let's just go for it and put in the rest of these darks here ultramarine is a good one to use because um, it's transparent and it makes lovely washes um, you mix it with Ugh, sorry. That's probably not the way to do that, but I need a bigger brush now. I want to thin that out and put a nice wash in there and kind of pull it up there and spritz it to soften that edge. 
like that and pull it down. Vary the blue a little bit here and there. And the, the ultramarine that I'm using is actually called ultramarine light. And whatever this burnt sienna is that I'm using, I'm not really loving it. I'll bet the one that you're using is nicer in a way. And I'm just dropping in some burnt sienna here and there on this thing along the edges and going to continue along by just pulling this down and it should be darker towards the bottom so keep adding your ultramarine down there and once you add it in there kind of just let it go over here it gets softer this is a hard painting for you to uh, especially when you know I'm kind of going fast so we can go over it again sometimes slower or you can just kind of watch and then finish it uh, watching the video on slow time. Um, a few little blue marks there. You can also give it a little spritz to break up some of that so it doesn't look quite so heavy. And I notice in here she's got a little bit of, she drops in a little bit of bright blue here and there. And also right there. And then you basically do the same thing to the other side of this painting. Right down here. I could have used a little bit bigger brush, I think, because um, those washes are pretty, uh, you know, you, you want them to be nice and fluid and a lot of paint on your brush. This needs a little more water to um, just get. I should have used real ultramarine and not ultramarine light because real ultramarine's got more pigment. It's darker, and um, you need you kind of need that for this, but it's okay. So. I'll have to let some of that dry and um, then we go back in and look at the look at your wash that if you're doing it let me look on here oh you're painting long only till I need a break I'm fine um, once you've kind of got that in there you're gonna let it sit and then we're gonna go back in with some other colors after it dries but um, this uh, what am I trying to say um, this area where in between there's like a little transition here between the light and shadow where there's some definition on this the sides of these buildings so I want to try to put that in a little bit right there it's a little bit and I'm just trying to mix up warm you know warm colors for these areas of the church where where it's warm here by the around that window under the rooftops there and um, you know any other little places where there's some warm spots I want to try to drop some of those in Right here, right now, that that's wet would be a nice little place for a hint of um, that goldish color, and even um, I'm 
little bits of color here and there. Let's see, over here under this roof. Got some dark color there. And a little bit of Yeah, I'm not what, sure what kind of sample paper this is. It might be more of a student grade because the washes don't look like they're acting normally to me, but I don't know. Hold on, I'll be right back. I need Joe to get me another spritzer. <laughs> okay, let's see what I can do with this. See, I don't like what's happening over here. It's just not a very pretty wash, the way it's soaked into the paper. It's kind of like it's soaking in weird, like, a, like cheap paper does. And... Um, uh, so, I, you know, I don't know, it's, it's a little odd, but you don't get the same, the washes aren't as transparent or as pretty, but anyway, we'll fix it up. Okay, so while that's drying, there are some details I can put in by just taking straight burnt sienna, burnt umber. In this case, I'm gonna grab this. I guess it's a burnt umber here. It certainly looks better than the. And I'm gonna put some detail lines in. A little bit of. see here there's some definition to this rooftop and a little bit of this tower once you start adding the details it really will come alive for you now this um this thing here is dark obviously can I get it black enough? You can get it dark if you mix your ultramarine with burnt sienna. a window there or something. There's another. And this is light, this thing on top of this church. 
I didn't make that look very good, but... You just really want to suggest some of these details with the right value, and um, you'll get a pretty good result if you just suggest them. Here there's uh, something, some stained glass or something in the middle of this thing. It's just a, an odd shape. Oh, way too heavy. Soften that line. Okay. Oh, let's see. This could be a little darker here again. Probably with a different color though. I kind of like that quinacridone gold for some of this. Only because I'm really not liking the burnt sienna that I'm using. And um, I had a good tip from another watercolor painter. I'll probably like the new burnt sienna light from Alvaro maybe. Um, is that the light red from Windsor Newton is very good to use for um, instead of burnt sienna in some cases anyway so some of these little mm, building details over here have some pretty good dark things going on so I've mixed up some burnt umber with ultramarine burnt umber is even darker than burnt sienna so whoops I want a warm dark. Is that Jojo? How's your spritzer, honey? I could use a fresher. <laughs> you want to say hi to Cat? Come here. Hey, Cat. Come here. There he is. <laughs> hey, Jojo. He's going to get me another spritzy. <laughs> We're going to keep painting. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, there we go. Okay. So here we go. Let's see. We got. That roof there, we've got a shadow under this thing. So while I have this dark kind of color, this burnt umber and blue color on my um, paintbrush, I'm using it to suggest some of these other shapes here, uh, details, lines, and things that are happening to give it, you know, the body. Ooh, that it needs. That's dark. I didn't need it quite that dark. You can always touch it with your finger or a little damp paper towel to lighten that up. I'm not sure I like that shape, but there we go. This side of this tower has a little darkness to it. I quite found the right thing for that. I think I need it to be a little bit more golden, like a warm I don't know. Okay. Fading down into blue. And, uh, let's see here. There oh. you go. Wow, thanks. Thank you. Cheers, Kat. That's nice, honey. That's nice. You're painting. Hmm. Thank you. We're working on it. All right. All right. There we go. Goodbye. A little more um, suggest maybe some little architectural things on these buildings here. And she's what she's done is she's added this bright blue. I don't know what color she's using for this, but it looks like a hyper blue. It's just such a beautiful color she has on there. I'd love to know what it is, but I'll just use cerulean since I can't even see on this thing hardly. See those touches of blue over here? I don't know what she's used there, but they're very pretty. I don't think it's cerulean. I think it's something else. Maybe she's mixed it with a little gouache or white to make it 
Um, it'd be interesting to know. Maybe I should take her class. Here we go. Ooh, I don't like that. Okay. All right, some more. So, you know, this kind of thing is, you could go for days in the detail of this, trying to get it just so. Um, working, you know, on these dry, uh, and just looking at the values and carving out details forever. But it'll be interesting to see how this dries because I'm not, a, um, I haven't used this paper and I don't want to say it's, that it's not good. I just am not familiar with it and um, I'm not sure what, you know, I picked it up at the Art of the Carolinas sale. So, I mean, I've used Fabriano paper before and it's been fine, but this is a different kind of thing, I think. Uh, it might be a different grade of Fabriano that I'm not familiar with. I don't really know. All right, so maybe a couple more details right here in the front foreground, and I'll put a few final dashes here on the warm up some of these little areas here on these buildings. Nice warm around there, leading into that. And maybe even just a splattering of that up there. I just put a little tiny bit of yellow ochre on there and then I'm adding in a little blue. A little bit of cobalt for the shadow. Oops, to let that mix and melt in. You can let it mix on the paper sometimes if you want. Or you can use burnt sienna in there if you want it more. You don't really want it to turn green, so. Ultramarine, burnt sienna. You can even put a tiny bit of yellow ochre in there. Ooh, well, I got it a little bit too blue, but. So, um, I'm kind of okay with sort of the way this is. Looking, I think I might take some uh, I guess more of this color and just splotch a little bit of this spritz it and splotch a little bit of this warm color down in here for like some reflected warm light in the, sh in the shadows, I guess is what they would call it. And um, and then maybe a little cooler on this side, just to add a little more pure dark blue and burnt sienna. I almost want to add a little bit of, no, probably not. Maybe a little alizarin to get it a little more purpley. Yeah. Such a pure blue, dark blue. Maybe a little neutral tint. It's a little, a little dark in there. There we go. So I've just added a little neutral tint, which has kicked up the darks here a notch. because I think it needed a little more dark value. 
Same thing probably is needed on this side. So a little neutral tint with the dark blue. Right down into there. Because it, it dries lighter and you have to really knock those dark values in really dark in the beginning. And anywhere I want to blur the paint a little more, just add a tiny bit of water and let the paint kind of do the work. Add water and paint. You know, you don't want to dilute these dark washes, but you, sometimes you want them to flow, so you want a little more water on your brush. Oh, I like that nice burst I got there to make them flow. Otherwise, if you just keep going over it and over it and over it, you're just gonna get um, brush marks if it's not wet enough. And maybe into that, I'll splatter a little bit of that blue there. Actually, a lot of that splatter. And again, maybe a little bit of the yellow ochre or burnt sienna splattered over here. Oof, get on there. It won't come off my brush. I need a little more. I just want a little more burnt sienna on this side splattered into the shadow. <laughs> I better check. Oh, you're enjoying it. Cutest couple ever. Well, I don't know about that. We're Joe's pretty cute. I'm I'm a I'm a piece of work cat, as you know. I'm I'm more more of a handful than most people probably would, well, maybe they'd realize it. I don't know. But anyway, there's that. There's, oof, it's a little bit too yellow. Let's knock that down a little bit. There we go. All right. And then I'm going to put some birds on this and dry it up, maybe splatter a little water there. Let's see what else I can make look interesting before I give up on it. Oh, a nice little dot. Oh, I didn't really get a good dot there. Ugh. Oh well. Oh, now I've really messed up. Oh, that's not too bad. Let's just put it up there. A little dot. A little more definition maybe on some of these architectural details and let's put a little bit more there. Inside this stained glass window, there's a beautiful little blue thing there, which I didn't really do very effectively, but there's that. And a little blue on the shadow there on that side. And you can even add a little dab of warm there. I would be very careful though, if you do get this um, quinacridone gold, it's, you don't want to use a lot of it and you kind of want to mix it with other things when you, you know, to kind of soften it up a little because it is pretty goldy. Like you might want to add a little burnt sienna to it. 
It's straight out of the tube on its own. It's very strong. do here maybe um, a couple little shadows coming down from here across there that one doesn't look very good that's good and maybe down here there's another one could have had a little more blue in there and up here that one looks pretty good now Oops, shouldn't have done that. All right. Let's put a little more dark in that, some of these windows. I'm not happy with this little steeple thing here. One thing, it's not, I don't really have it set up on the top shape there very well. Maybe if I made it more like a steeple, it would look better. And the shadow's too far over. Try to soften that out, lighten it up. Well, Kat, I can tell you, I think it looks better on the video maybe than in real person. So, <laughs> uh, I better have a sip. He made me this new spritzer, so. I'm just going to put a few more little dots and dashes on dry brush though whenever you're doing these little details generally they need to be with thick paint kind of thick paint and you know a dry brush you don't want a sloppy wet brush when you're trying to get a saturated dark pigment color to do details you really want it to be um, pretty dense with paint and dry brush you can so right here I'm gonna try to get this tower looking a little bit better a couple details there and put my birds in because I have a really dark mix on my palette right now. And maybe just a couple dots here and there. So Kat, I know you guys were planning on traveling and going 
I think you said to Ireland or somewhere? Is that still on the books or is that all messed up too with this? Ugh, wrong color. All right, well, yeah, this paper is the wrong, it's the wrong deal. It's just not, oh, it's a mess. Um, I think I'll dry it. Oh, you guys were going to go to Spain. How fun! Because he speaks Spanish, too, so... That would have been amazing. So now I guess all your plans are on hold. Everybody's plans are on hold. I mean, this is just insanity. What time is it? Oh, it's 6.36! Oh my god! Okay. I always stop at 6.30 so I can watch the news. So I'm going to say farewell, my dear. Here is our beautiful painting. I'll show you up close. So everybody can see it, and DJ and Paulina can see it tomorrow. I won't sign it because it is not my... Um, it's not my photograph. I don't know what it is, but and then as far as the paper, the this is um, it's watercolor studio Fabriano, 140 pounds, cold press. But you know what? It's not 100% um, cotton, and that's why I'm pretty sure. I mean, I don't know for a fact, but if I looked it up, I'll bet this is not 100% cotton because I can just tell by the way it feels. It's a little slick. It's not the soft cottony kind of thing. And so that's why when you use good paper, um, your washes are much better. They don't turn out muddy and yucky like this. So, um, but now I know. And there it is. And, um, if you do it on really nice paper, it's it's good to practice on cheap paper, but I mean, not too cheap of paper, but like if you're just doing a sketch 